Schwarzenegger. Total Recall. We hope you enjoyed the ride. Ah! It was a dream project. If Arnold's body is the perfect vehicle for his soul, this movie is a kind of perfect vehicle for Arnold. I feel like I was meant for something more than this. This was a very action-oriented picture, very special effects-oriented picture. And of course, this had the brilliance of the Phil Dick concept to play off of, and that's why it was such a milestone movie. It was a thinking man's action movie. Sorry, Quaid. Your whole life is just a dream. Is it the reality of a dream, or is it the reality of somebody that has a dream but comes out of the dream? My name is not Quaid. Total Recall was just an action-packed movie. I think it was probably 74 that I optioned this story. It was Phil Dick, who was then not a known author at all. Phil Dick was a struggling pulp writer most of his career until Blade Runner got made. Phil Dick is concerned with what is reality. Virtual reality, the idea, you know, you, you feed the senses and your brain will construct an entire world inside of your mind. Philip Dick went into very well and very clearly that if you have a, a virtual reality, you can't tell the difference. I mean, it's not as if you have a bad, fake virtual reality. I mean, the beauty of the concept is that, no, no, it's a virtual reality that's indistinguishable from reality. Your brain will not know the difference. The original Total Recall, which was then called We Can Remember It For You Wholesale, it appeared in one of those magazines I always used to read, Galaxy and Fantasy Science Fiction. And it appeared there, and it was a 23-page short story. This was the first story that knocked me right out, which I knew could make an incredible movie. I knew it would be incredibly expensive. I optioned that for $1,000 up front. I became aware of Dan O'Bannon's work. So I went to meet Dan, and he, had, he had just graduated from USC, he was about 28 then, and he said, look, I think we can work together. And we launched in full speed into trying to make Total Recall. And everybody said, no, it's too expensive. Most people who read the first half of the script felt it was one of the best screenplays they'd ever read. But everybody also kind of agreed that it fell apart. In the, somewhere in the second half. There were 40 drafts, but the last draft and the first draft were really essentially not different, like in the point that nobody had solved the third act. The second act didn't come too hard. About a year it took us. But three or four years before that third act, the inspiration of everybody can relate to our air is choking. And when they punished the Martian mutants, they just threatened to cut off their air. So when they did that to them, and the hero could do this larger-than-life gesture if he could turn the device that the aliens had left millions of years ago buried, and the whole planet would get atmosphere. So we had our ending, and the whole story seemed to just fall right into place. Total Recall was around for years and years and years, and it went from one place to the other, from one producer to the other, from one studio to the other, and uh, it finally settled with Dina De Laurentiis. They had stayed for a very long time. Many directors were attached, like Cronenberg, for example. As I recall, there were seven directors, most prominently sticking out in my mind, was Richard Rush, who did The Stuntman. He and Dino couldn't agree because he liked our third act of Total Recall, and Dino didn't. The new Mars gets air. I said, no like. I said, why? He said, air, too hard. I can't visualize. And Richard Rush said, but it's wonderful. You know, it works perfectly. He says, Dick, I can't go with you as director. I, I don't even want to go to Mars. And I said, well, you can't take that. It's in my contract, you know. He said, it'll never get made. I said, fine, I'd rather never make it. And I said, the Mars, Mars is in and Mars gets here. It'll work. It's the first ending that's worked. You know, show it to another director. So one day, I get a call. He says, Ron. I love you so much I could kiss you on the mouth. You saved me. Are you so goddamn stubborn? You saved me. I showed this script to Bruce Beresford. First director I showed it to, I say, you know, take out Mars, take out air. He said, Dino, you full of shit. He said, I'm a full of shit. He's right. He said, the best thing in it is Mars and air. We go. Come to the house. We go with this version. So we, I went to that house. We all hugged each other. And Bruce started, went to Australia and we started pre-production with Patrick Swayze in the lead. And it was during that period, after all this time, seven years, that Dino's public company, which we had formed a year or two earlier, finally had several flops in a row and he had to go bankrupt and that included the Total Recall project. 
So Beresford called us. He says, the movie's off. Dino's gone bankrupt. He fired 80 people, and they're tearing down the sets as I look out the window. And we had thought that was it. Let's do it. Do what? Move to Mars. Arnold had always loved it, but he wasn't as big a star as he was. He read it four years earlier. So I was always on top of that movie and checked it out because I loved that story. Dino felt that... Uh, the story would work much better if uh, it's not me starring it. And he had his reasons for it. I was uh, not about to, to argue his reasons because he had his, and I had mine why I should be doing it, of course. You know, that was the way it went. Drive! Drive! Would you please repeat the destination? Arnold really wanted to do it and never got the chance. Dino was very adamant, you won't get it. So when the, when the project was in jeopardy and when Gino had to sell it, Arnold rushed to Mario Casar and said, that is the script you have to buy for me. So they bought it. Within the next few hours, they made a deal. And then I get this call from Arnold and he says, Ron, he said, uh, get ready, pack your bags, we go. We're going to make the movie. I said, what movie? He says, isn't there a movie you've been trying to make for about 10 years? I said, oh, it's in bankruptcy. He said, well, I just took it out. Back up. We're going to be making the movie right away. And that was it. In the original versions, the character was more like a kind of timid, um, nearly accountant type, which was completely a different approach. I thought that that switch from being powerful physically and then being put in the position of being vulnerable is a much more, a, a stronger kind of contrast. And that's why I thought that the character should be uh, played by me rather than by someone that is an ordinary kind of a looking guy. You know from the minute you see Arnold that eventually he's going to go in the phone booth, take off his shirt and Superman, and here we go! No way do, did we feel that it was acceptable to make Arnold Schwarzenegger somebody who was basically a timid guy. That was not Arnold. The first thing I did was, I called Paul Verhoeven and I said, remember when we met a few months ago after you came out with Robocop? And I said to you, he says, Paul, you and I, we have to work together. You're exactly my style of directing, my style of visual looks. It's a visual feast watching your movies. It's like extraordinary. So, so he says, yeah, I remember that. And I said, well, I have the project for us now. Arnold needs a director that he really um, respects. And Paul's like a real tough guy. And Arnold's a big 900-pound uh, canary. You know, he squawks, you get, he gets what he wants, but uh, uh, he respects Paul a lot. Paul has a certain way of directing. He's very energetic. He's outrageous. You know, he's, he's always continuously, you know, like, well, I, 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 I think that you, you, you can go around the corner, I mean, much faster, and then you go bang, 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 bang. Can you not? I mean, it, uh, why not? I mean, let's do it again. Let's do it again. I mean, this is how he talks. All the time, it's like... Uh, I pushed him, you know, and I, 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 I helped him. I was laying with him on the floor or in the mud and saying, like this, and you should... I think you have to give more accent to this word or push this a little bit harder. It has to be a bit faster. Don't be so slow. Do it three, four, five times. And because Arnold is a guy that has, in fact, no ego in that direction, you know? He's not like, oh, basically, don't hurt me. It's more like, oh, fuck, yeah. I mean, he's open-minded. It's, it's somebody that looks, looks at his own problems, mistakes, or whatever, and is able to deal with that instead of saying, they're not true. It's all fine. I'm great. I'm wonderful. He's not like that at all. And all of a sudden, all the pieces came together in that. And we didn't go to Australia. We went to Mexico. Paul sent me to the Ames Research Institute in uh, San Francisco. They sent me to Houston to walk on the Space Lab. We started contacting colleges that were doing research on how one might live on another planet, gathering research, showing it to Paul. And then he felt free to make a movie, <laughs> like a normal movie. You get illustrators in, starting to draw uh, concepts that are uh, in the script. We build models of different settings in the movie. It was a pretty big budget movie at the time, very, you know, pretty expensive movie. And uh, the only way we'd, we could do it is to go down to Mexico. And there were 10 stages, nine of them we kept uh, building sets. And so every stage had maybe three or four sets built on them to fill these huge 180 by 80, 90 foot wide stages. We worked seven days a week for almost nine, 10 months. And it was the only way to get it done. 
There were uh, local locations that we used. We used the, I think, the Zocalo down in the uh, subway system. But of course, we also repainted the whole subway system, painted it gray. So even if we were on location, it was a monumental task. The choice of going to Mexico City was a great choice because the architecture in Mexico City is unlike anything else. We found architecture that's called um, New Brutalism. It was a very dark, a bit, bit heavy-handed concrete style that gave the movie a very definite architectural um, uh, uh, production design. We felt that it would be nice to be inside a nuclear reactor. You know, nuclear reactors, they have these poles that go in, in water. And I thought, okay, if, suppose that these poles are gigantic, you know, that they are like, like skyscrapers, that big, and they're hanging from the ceiling. What we found which was uh, skyscrapers that were designed, um, let's say, in a kind of a really a bit surrealistic way in the beginning of the century. And Bill Flandell uh, was looking at these things, and then so somehow he say, well, you know, that's yeah, something like that, but how do we do that? It would stick out out of the ground and something like that. And so we threw it on the ground, the book. But it came in a situation on the ground that it was reversed. So suddenly, the skyscrapers that were raising up were hanging down. And then we looked at, these, at, at, at it and looked at each other and said, wow, that's it that we're going to do. That looks great. The experience in Mexico working with Arnold and the crew and the Mexican crew we had, which was a great crew too, I mean, it was wonderful. And I think back to Total Recall with a lot of, 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 of warmth and pleasure. Everybody be careful, yeah? Whenever you shoot in Mexico, uh, that weeds out uh, right away the strong from the wimps. You know, you're in the middle of like the smog capital of the, actually the world. The breathing was like two packs a day of cigarettes just to breathe the air in Mexico City. Our uh, uh, producer slash UPM, Elliot Schick, one of the toughest guys in Hollywood, had to be uh, medevaced out. His eyeballs bugged out. <laughs> Paul was very sick near the end. He used to have an ambulance, I think, on the set for him so that they could, you know, give him fluid and everything to keep him going. And One had to be constantly mindful of the sprinting distance to the nearest restroom at any time you were filming, and that, of course, added a layer of complexity to what we were doing. The Americans sometimes get really carried away with all this kind of stuff, you know, living clean and, and not, not to get any germs noticed. Everybody laughed at me because I was a complete hypochondriac. I was terrified to go to Mexico. I wouldn't brush my teeth with any water but bottled water. And finally, every week, I insisted on a B12 shot. Everybody said, what good is that? That's bullshit crap, you know? But I was one of the, the only two people that didn't get sick were me and Arnold. He survived very, very well. I mean, he had his own food flown in from Los Angeles, and he had his own cook that was making his stuff in, in his trailer. And so um, the only time that he got sick was when his cook got sick and he had to eat with ass. <laughs> <laughs> it was clear that to keep the budget in balance, we could not afford next to Arnold some other people that would be extremely expensive. Rachel came in the first day and Sharon came in the second day. And I did scenes with them personally. I just tested them and did the scenes of Arnold. And after three days of casting, I said to Arnold, I think we have the girls, you know? I mean, this is Rachel and this is Sharon. <laughs> It's nice to be aggressive, uh, you know, every once in a while. I mean, in the, in the martial arts thing, we, we were punching um, pads, and, and I really found that <laughs> enjoyable, you know? I mean, now I understand why people have, you know, punching bags in their, in their homes. It does. It gets out a lot of aggression. So I, you know, I get into it. What a bitch. I'd like to show you my honorary stunt woman association. <laughs> I earned this, okay? Sharon Stone was terrific to work with because she was as dedicated as all the other ones were. She was training like a machine. I mean, she was like a female Terminator. I shot for, for a couple weeks on this film and then went home and came back. When I got home the first time, I looked like a Dalmatian because when you throw a punch and it just stops against Arnold's arm, 
It's like hitting a brick wall about 60 miles an hour. I was just black and blue and sore and just, I couldn't believe it. You know how much I hate this fucking planet. This was one of the last of the non-digitally composited movies, so we had to figure out ways of filming uh, with cameras and actual miniatures almost all of the images. Except for the skeletons that appeared on the skeleton screens, everything that you see is something that has been created and photographed by a camera. Well, that's a rumor, isn't it? I think so. For example, when we see Arnold on the train heading into the Mars City, the camera pulls away from that, you see Arnold in the window of the train, the camera pulls up and you can see all of Mars. It's, it's a geography shot. It sets the uh, exposition of what Mars looks like. And that was done with three different scales of miniatures and motion control camera moves that tied them in together. Very complicated and very difficult to do. I think back now when we have uh, the ability to digitally enhance shots, how much easier things uh, like that would be if we were doing them today. This was the top level of visual effects and special effects that I have ever worked with or that we have ever seen. Because we hired the best companies, uh, the best visual effects people, everyone was the best. I worked on the skeleton sequence, which was one of the first pieces of CG in uh, a feature film. Part of the problem had been up to that point that CG didn't look real. It didn't look photo real. So it, it took until like Abyss and like uh, Total Recall where things were starting to, be, to look real enough for people to include in the film. The way the, the sequence was done was the original photography was shot. Then later we came back to do the reenactment with Arnold and the extras who had been in the original photography. We then had a stage Arnold later. He came in, put on all of our little reflective balls. All this stuff had to be computed at high resolution, uh, shot on our film recorder, and then we took it and gave it to DreamQuest. The funny thing was that the technology at the time made this whole sequence, which now you could probably do on your PC. There's a scene in the middle of Total Recall that was one time was pulled out of the movie, which is where they actually land on Mars, you see all the trains and all that stuff. That scene was, was going to be not done for uh, financial reasons. And I remember I talked to Paul and said, Paul, that's the only exterior I think we ever show Mars. We must have this. We, we, are, we are never outside. We have no big shots of Mars. That's all we need is one or two of these things. And it was one of those things I actually talked to Arnold about it, and then it got put back into the movie. When the studio would start to get jittery about some new two, three hundred thousand dollars set or issue or more days, Arnold backed Paul all the way. You know, it takes a lot to buffalo these studios, and Paul was happy that Arnold was behind him every second, and it helped because he's the uh, cash cow. <laughs> we have a scene at the end of Total Recall where they're being sucked out of this, of the things that activate to make the air. Well, as we were shooting the movie, Paul had the idea of tilting it so that they would be hanging this way and you'd, it would look like they don't have to have any wires or anything that way. <laughs> That was the team of Robotine, who I had worked with on the Robocop. You got a lot of nerve showing your face around here. Paul Verhoeven was told, do something really weird, Paul. And he goes, really weird? Yes. Of course, the people looked stranger than in any other movie that you've ever seen. All, all that stuff was done, done by Robotine. Basically uh, doing um, uh, makeup effects, special makeup effects for the picture, and also doing uh, special visual effects, character visual effects, like people transforming, things like that. The difference of the two is that the first, which is the special makeup effects, uh, are applying makeups and things to an actor, so it, it changes their physical appearance and they perform with those. The uh, special visual effects, or the character effects, are basically uh, uh, cable controlled creatures or people that actually transform. There's no actor involved. We hope you enjoy the ride. <laughs> the 
fat lady. We used the real actress so you could see, oh, she looks like him. You start laughing, you think it's Arnold, but then her face splits open. <laughs> That was definitely a groundbreaking effect. Get ready for a surprise! The most complex one, of course, was Cuato. What do you want, Mr. Quay? It had to be done with um, 15 puppeteers that would do all the, that would do the arms and the eyes and the mouth. Botine had made the thing so real. Two people asked me if it was a real freak, a semi-born uh, Siamese twin. No wonder he kept out of sight. Our uh, visual effects work on Total Recall was given a special achievement academy award and that means that the academy votes in advance that this film has su sufficient merit for it to be announced uh, prior to the award show so we knew we were going to win it was a, a peak moment in my life for us to go up on stage and stand there you know in front of a billion people watching and uh, accept the award ah! with the um, total recall i sort of could go out a little bit further and try some different things and become a little bit more experimental. I think the score for, for Total Recall was, you know, fairly avant-garde. It was very difficult. I remember reading at the time there, the, you know, a lot of the criticism of the score was there was no theme, which was nonsense. There was, it was a very strong theme that ran through it. It just wasn't perhaps one of those kind of things you would go away whistling or something, but it was very thematic and it went through it all. Paul and I worked very well together because Paul can talk to me in intellectual and emotional terms because you can't verbalize music. How does one? Uh, uh, describe the color red. And more violence last night on Mars, where terrorists demanding independence once again halted the extraction of turbinium ore. The, the political background for this movie really comes out of the, the 60s and the 70s. The idea is that, you know, government is bad, even if it's our government. Usually you're allowed to say the other government is bad, but this was, this was the world government that they lived under, and it was oppressing the people of Mars. Sir, the oxygen level is bottoming out in Sector G. What do you want me to do about it? Don't do anything. But they won't last an hour, sir. Fuck them. The political idea was, of course, the abuse of the, of the dictator based on the fact that he, that he wanted to get as much money out of it and put as m little money into it. That, of course, was the theme of the movie. The first settlers are buried here. They worked themselves to death, but Kohagen ended up with all the money. It was an evil empire created on Mars that was, you know, making the people uh, kind of work for their oxygen. <laughs> I mean, it's a parable for our times, I and mean, it's a riot of uh, commercialism, you know, gone amok, you know, all of these brand names and mutant people and their kids, and you see what, uh, you know, what this greenhouse effect is about to do to us. Let's go. I felt it was extremely important for me from a philosophical level, to make a movie that had two levels, and that both levels throughout would always be consistent, and that you could never say, now we are in a dream, or now we are in reality. It was Paul Verhoeven who honed in on the idea that we should really take seriously the idea that the whole thing might really be a dream. What is a dream? What is just an imagination? What is uh, an artificial reality? What is an implanted reality? Stop punishing yourself, Doc. You've got to want to return to reality. Even at the very end, there is no decision made. And at the very end, he says, kiss me fast before, before the dream ends, isn't it? If it is a dream. And then we fade to white. The music makes, brings, the, brings the other team in, isn't it, at the very end. If you listen to the music, uh, Jerry Goldsmith brings in the team of, of let's say, of dream. It wasn't a thing, it was a little motif. I think it was electronic, actually. And it was sort of planted earlier in the movie, I guess, is sort of one of the big question marks. 
from the point of view that it was all a dream, he gets lobotomized. <laughs> of course, an audience with Arnold Schwarzenegger in the main part would not want him to dream. So to a large degree, by choosing Arnold, there was a preference for reality. You're not here, and neither am I. People saw the movie and they came at him saying, well, was it a dream or was it real? Because I didn't, I thought that was just kind of be, people would sort of take that as like just a little curly cue at the end. And they wouldn't really take it seriously. But they did, they got into it. <laughs> you think this is the real Quaid? It is. The film was, have, was attacked because of the violence. <laughs> I accept violence on a much higher level than a lot of other pe people do. For me, it's just another way of, of, of showing things. It's my dreams or my, or my nightmares or whatever that I basically give to the audience. The scene on the elevator was a good example on that. An innocent bystander is, 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 is killed. But I thought, okay, this is just a piece of meat. That's a very uh, uh, uncomfortable statement, of course. This whole body was blown to pieces, really. I shouldn't laugh about it, but I, I laugh about it because it's film. It's not real. A lot of people have complained that there are 50, 60 people killed or something like that. Kill them all! Yeah, that's true. He is supposed to be a really super agent in it, a James Bond in Square. So I felt that he was a guy that was able to blow away everybody. We really didn't do it so it felt like it was exploitation. I mean, it was just... Horrific. <laughs> consider that a divorce. The original line was, consider this a divorce, and then he shoots her, but I mean, <laughs> we felt that was a little too cold-blooded. The violence in the movie is extreme, yes. And in fact, it was more extreme when the movie was made. And ultimately, we toned it down. <laughs> we had to tone it down because of the MPA gave us an X. I, I thought that it was all it fit in perfectly well, the, the, the body count, because it was a very hectic uh, kind of a movie. <laughs> but of course, uh, Paul, I think, gave them that cut so they have something to complain about. And then he would cut it down. See at the party, Richter! So it was on both sides uh, were people that admired it and others that really uh, felt it was over the top and, and disgusting, which is uh, really uh, not nothing new. Your mind, it is the center of your life. It is everything you hear, everything you see, everything you feel. It is everything you are. We had no awareness whatsoever three weeks before. We had a 43% awareness, which is absolutely disastrous. And with Arnold's crowd, he convinced Carol Co. that they had to put up more advertising. So when finally opened, it was 99% recognition. How would you know if someone stole your mind? I think um, for its time it did very well. I mean, it, it, it made a lot of money and all over the world, I think at that time it was $250 million. It was a big hit, it opened very big. And everybody really liked it. We never go anywhere in the world. Total Recall is always mentioned. Everyone in the world recognizes the title because the movie was so big. That just shows you how big it was in my career, how important it was in my career. And it really made me uh, make a big leap forward because of Total Recall. Kiss me quick before you wake up. <laughs> <laughs>